Hi, everyone. Welcome to our 30th show. And for our 30th show, I wanted to make this one special. So I'm bringing um, to you an interview with Phil Eichinger, who was on Ativan and other meds for 30 years. So if you ever thought you couldn't get off of medication because you were on too long or you're too sick, his story is going to be uplifting because he will tell you he is totally healed now. And it was a lot of work to get there. There's going to be a couple of moments when he's speaking. There's going to be a pause because he gets very emotional about what he had to go through to get better. So please tell your friends or your other Benzo friends to listen to this story of hope. And stay tuned after the show for our post-show talk. Thank you. Hi, Phil. Welcome to the podcast. Hi. How are you? Good, good. You know, normally I start off by asking people what led them to being prescribed a benzo. But in your case, if you don't mind, I want to ask you how you feel today. Because I think when people hear your story, they're going to know for sure that there is a light at the end of the tunnel. Yes. Um, first of all, I, and, uh, uh, I wanted to say thanks to you for having me. Um, I have followed your work for a long time, and you've been dedicated to this community uh, gosh, I'm guessing it's over 20 years now. Yeah, about 23 years now. Yeah. Yeah. And, and there, there's never enough voices uh, and certainly appreciate yours. Okay. Um, what I thought I would comment on uh, today is really, really threefold when it comes to my story, Geraldine. I think that, um, you know, we, we first is is what happened, but, but I take a little bit of a different approach there. Uh, secondly, how it affected uh, uh, me uh, in terms of my mental health and mental well-being. And then third, how it affected my family, um, which yes. is uh, really the key piece. Right. I wanted to, I want to hit on all of that because, you know, again, people need to hear every single aspect of how it affected us. Yeah. And so, you know, to start out with with uh, what happened, I I I like to now kind of move through that piece uh, a, a, a little quicker um, mm -hmm. than I did uh, when I was only a few years healing, um, because I really want this to be uh, a message of of hope um, that 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 we can get better. I, I will tell you that. I have calls this afternoon um, with two folks um, that we are assisting in getting into some inpatient help. And um, if I could do a little uh, uh, commercial for, for, for what we do, mm -hmm. it is that so many of us talk about uh, the holidays and right. using the time around the holidays uh, to, to get better. And uh, many of our businesses uh, are slow over the, the Christmas and New Year break. And, and many, many people take the end of year and New Year uh, to begin their road to recovery. And now with COVID affecting so much in terms of livelihood and work, uh, it's really a perfect time uh, to do it. So, so I'll start off by saying, if you've been struggling and are currently struggling with benzodiazepines or any other type of addicted uh, 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 substance, uh, now is the time. <laughs> uh, let's 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 get better. Um, and as you said, there is a light at the end of the tunnel. Um, I suffered from anxiety, uh, and because of that depression, I, I think that I know we talk about anxiety, depression a lot in the same sentence. Sometimes we talk about anxiety and depression together. I will tell you, in my particular instance. I think my depression was derived from my anxiety. Uh, I was I was so tired um, all the time because of my anxious mind uh, and my anxiety that I think that that's what led me to be depressed because I really um, had no energy um, to devote to the things that really brought me joy and happiness in life. And so uh, I had my first panic attack when I was 16 driving on a train uh, and I'll tell you, it was one of the most horrifying experiences of my life. Uh, it almost felt like an out-of-body experience. And those who have suffered from acute panic uh, uh, episodes, um, it is it, uh, the only word I can think to use is it's terrorizing. And so I had a, a, a consistent 24-7 anxiety. I describe it to people as 
instead of driving your car with one foot on the gas to go and one foot on the brake to stop, it's almost like you're going through life with your, with your feet pinned on both the gas and the brake at all times. So you're expending a lot of energy, uh, not going anywhere. And if you are going anywhere, you're going either backwards or in circles. And so um, I met a psychiatrist my senior year of college and was prescribed benzos. Um, I was given a mixture over the last 30 years from, from Ativan uh, to Xanax uh, to Klonopin um, and to sleep uh, was uh, at times given Ambien, which, uh, as you know, I, I consider part of the, the uh, uh, benzo family because of its right. effect on our GABA receptors and went on for the next uh, 30 years uh, switching around the medications and increasing when necessary. And then when they would, uh, using a technical term here, poop out on me, um, I would move to something else. Uh, I would say probably I, three, four years ago, Jolene, I got to the point where they were not working at, at all. Um, and I knew uh, it was time to try uh, at, at, at the ripe old age then of 50 um, to try to get better. And, and, and it's funny, I used a year-end scenario um, with my birthday being on January 15th. I decided that I was going to uh, start for the new year uh, and go from there. Um, because quite frankly, you know, we say it all the time, we get sick and tired of feeling sick and tired. I was sick. Um, in terms of re rehashing uh, the war stories of what happened um, and, and the physical pain uh, uh, and the anguish. Uh, I, I, I'll brush over that, as I said before, um, because uh, as we say in the rooms, um, we tell each other stories on a daily basis. And so many of the stories and so much of what we hear online uh, is the blood, guts and, and, and war uh, of, of, of what it is being on these medications and trying to get off them. And I'll tell you, uh, first bit of advice today is for the most part, I, I, I learned to stay off online. I stay, stay away from, from getting online and diagnosing myself, um, because that is a rabbit hole, uh, that will set you back worse than any recovery plan, uh, could ever. So, um, when, when I got off, I, I, I look, I, I wish, I wish I had been told more about what to expect, um, but the, the, the physical piece of it, um, I knew kind of what was coming. When, when I talk about, you know, I wish I knew what to expect, I meant more of the long term, uh, what pause was, um, and some of the mental anguish that comes with it. But, but in, terms of the, in terms of the physical withdrawal of getting off these medications, um, you know, I, I kind of understood uh, that, yeah, I, 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 was, I was going to be in a lot of pain. Um, I was going to have a rough ride. I was going to vomit. I was going to have a terrible uh, uh, time uh, uh, not staying outside of the bathroom. Um, I understood uh, uh, a little bit about the sweating and the way as the GABA receptors are left blind and need to regrow, that things like my body temperature would not be able to regulate. I'd be sweating. I'd be hot. I'd be freezing cold. I'd be shivering. Um, and, and I said before, I'd be vomiting. I'd be running to the bathroom. Um, I would have uh, terrible anxiety, worse than I ever did before I even started the medications. And so I, I, I kind of said to myself, you know, Geraldine, we, I, this I can get through. You know, this is withdrawal. This, these are the physical symptoms. And, you know, some of the things that I did, and, and I only speak for myself. I am not a doctor. Uh, uh, I don't give advice. Uh, all I can do is tell my story and what happened to me and what worked for me. Um, as I headed down this path, starting a new year and going through withdrawal, uh, a couple of things that helped, and, and, and I have a little bit uh, of a list of it, was right before the year ended when I started, I made sure that I had lots of clean clothing, lots of clean bed sheets, because I knew my body temperature was going to be uh, irregular. 
Um, I made sure that I bought a ton of Epsom salt, um, preferably lavender flavor, because that is one that soothes and calms the mind and body. And I would take roughly 10 to 15 red hot baths every single night. I mean, literally sometimes 20 minutes apart. And that would give me a little bit of relief from the anxiety. And it would give me, it was really the only thing that relieved my restless leg syndrome. Uh, I subscribed to Netflix, which was a godsend. And as a distraction, and you know distraction is a big piece of this, uh, especially when you're really in pain and you're really going through it and think you can't go any further. I watched binges of shows that, you know, I think I watched uh, Breaking Bad in like two and a half days, eight seasons. But what a great, great way to distract. I drank water, I drank more water, and I drank more water. I was drinking roughly 15 to 20 bottles a day of water, trying to flush the toxins. I was mixing it with lemon, either lemon juice or the little lemon container of the fake lemon uh, to give me some alkaloid and to also take care of some of the dehydration that I was going through. Um, because as you know, uh, you are not in the mood to eat much. Uh, you're so violently ill with the nausea. Um, I drank veggie juices. I ordered from online three cases of veggie juices because I knew I had to get my greens in me. And I also bought an awful lot of the vitamins, the emergency type stuff, uh, because vitamin C would really be the only thing that gave me a, even a little bit of energy. Uh, because when I, when I first started the withdrawal, I stayed up for approximately 13 days straight, which I thought was impossible, but now know that it's not. Um, and, then, and then I ate some fruits and I mixed in uh, oranges specifically because of the vitamin C. And then bananas, because with the Epsom salt, I found the bananas really helped with the restless leg. So they're, they're really, you know, for me, that was the diet that got me through, I would say, the first 30 days. After the first 30 days, I would force myself to do some light jogging and occasionally pick up a weight to try to build up a little bit of strength. Um, what did not work for me was an awful lot of advice I had gotten primarily online in terms of uh, 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 taking supplements and taking things that are not natural, removed from the source, uh, and, 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 and in a pill form. Um, you know, I was told that I needed to improve my dopamine, my serotonin, my GABA receptors need to re regrow, et cetera. And so, I mean, I, I, was, I tried tryptophan, I tried trazodone, I tried, uh, I tried uh, uh, um, uh, gosh, I'm trying to think here off the top of my head, um, amino acids, uh, niacin, uh, B12 for energy, uh, and what I found is I take some of this stuff today, years later, and I find it helpful. Um, but in the first six months of withdrawal, I found all of these well-meaning advice givers and, and, and amino acids and supplements and substances. Christ, I spent hundreds of dollars on this stuff. And looking back now, uh, I made a mistake there for me. Uh, and that sent me back. So, so, so that that Geraldine is 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 the is is kind of the 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 story of coming up and deciding to to get through the withdrawal and the steps and the physical physical things I did to help relieve uh, my symptoms. Um, after you know, after a couple of months, uh, I was extremely disappointed that I seemed to be getting worse. And boy, what I realized is, as I said earlier, if I could have found someone like you um, when I was going through this, my goodness, what a godsend it would have been. Because I'll tell you, this to me and the people that I talk to on a daily basis is where the relapse comes from. Um, again, so many folks concentrate on the physical symptoms and getting off of these poisons and what happens, the, 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 the nausea, the vomiting, the stomach troubles, the, 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 you know, the benzo belly, all that stuff. Oh, yeah. And as I, I said, 
I knew I could handle that because I knew there was a finite time to that. What I had no idea was coming was the mental piece of this and what it did to me and my family. So in terms of the first section, in terms of some remedies that I think helped me and some things that didn't help me, um, that closes the chapter there. In terms of the second chapter, I said I wanted to talk about three things with you today. Um, what I wasn't ready for and what I wish I had been a little better prepared for was the mental piece of this thing. Um, the looping thoughts, um, the, the, the thoughts and the preoccupation of death. Um, I, I, I thought I was dying all the time. Uh, I thought if I had a cold, I thought if I had a headache, that I had a brain tumor. I thought if I had a cold, that I had uh, uh, a pneumonia. I thought that I had, you know, if my muscles were a little sore, uh, I thought that I had MS um, and was self-diagnosing myself into obliterate and, because it didn't make sense to me. And, and, and nobody had talked about this part of it. Everybody talked about the withdrawal and you can get through it. Well, here I had gotten through that physical piece of it and I was six to 12 months out and feeling worse than I had ever felt. And I, 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 was, I was despondent, I was confused, and I had gotten to the point where I was getting near the end uh, and, and really getting close um, uh, to, to, to giving up. Uh, I hung in there, um, but the nightmares, um, the, 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 and, and I don't mean to be too graphic, Charlene, but I, I, I you know, the, the murders, the, the, the blood, the guts, the sickness, uh, my parents, something happening to them, my children, if they were going to, uh, back to college or take a trip somewhere, uh, I had visions of them in terrible car accidents. And I, and I, I really was same things. I did yeah, all I, the same things. Yeah. I was convinced that I, that I was absolutely crazy. Um, and you know, somebody told me down the road that, um, it's, it's a beautiful thing to think you're crazy, Geraldine, because the people that think they're crazy notice that there is a separation between their physical actions and their soul. And that the people that are crazy have no idea. <laughs> so you're, you're, you're okay thinking uh, that you're crazy, but the intrusive thoughts, um, the, the, the sadness, the, the deep depression, which I had never experienced before, the worry about my children, parents, and family, the preoccupation with death and dying, the anxiety that at six months was more relentless than it was during the physical withdrawal. Why am I such a terrible person? What happened to my life? I'm a terrible husband. I'm a terrible son. I'm a terrible father. Um, what is the point of, 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 of all this? I'm a complete failure. And what I can tell you now, and you started off our session today by talking about this, and I want everybody to hear me clearly, it's not you. That is not you. And say that to yourself over and over again. You are in such a flux in terms of chemical imbalance, and it takes such a long time, T-I-M-E, right, things I must earn, such time to regenerate like a potted plant. You put the seed in and you water it and water it and water it. it doesn't grow overnight. For it to become a big bush or a big tree, it takes a couple years. And so as you're regenerating your neurons and, and, your, and your receptors, um, this imbalance leads you to some crazy, crazy things. Gosh forbid, Geraldine, you make a small mistake like misplacing your keys or being late for a meeting. You will take out a baseball bat and beat yourself uh, till you are, are, are almost dead and bloodied uh, over the simplest things. Um, you'll internalize just about everything. And, uh, and, and I'll tell you, the, the, the thing that you said that, that I know, and I've heard you talk about this before um, with you and, and, and with some of the folks that, that you help, the looping thoughts, the negative intrusive thoughts 
that continue to play over and over and over again in your head and you can't stop them. Um, it, it, is, it, 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 it is like uh, 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 torture. It, it, it is like a, 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 a paper cut all over your body getting worse and worse and worse and being added to. Um, the, looping intrusive, the, the, the looping intrusive thoughts, um, I would have to say mentally, especially because they were so violent and ugly, was the worst part of this second stage. That first stage, we talked about the physical symptoms. I would say that my insomnia, anxiety, and restless leg syndrome were the three worst physical side effects. But in terms of this stage, this was an area where I didn't see a finite end to, which I couldn't see a physical improvement in. And so my message to everybody listening to today's podcast is, number one, it's not you. It's not you. When the thoughts come in, you have to practice thinking of them as a cloud in a sunny day, going through the sky, observe them, see that they're there, identify it as negative, and then watch it pass through as the sun comes back out again. Um, I have practiced for years now when the negative intrusive thoughts come in to identify them, not cling to them, just ID them and say, you know, oh, you little son of a gun, I see you there. And no, I am not a piece of shit. And no, I am not worthless. And no, I'm not a terrible father. Um, and after a while, as your brain regenerates neuroplasticity, as we call it, um, and, and, the, and, the, and you begin to regrow uh, uh, your, your receptors, um, believe me, folks, it begins to get better. If I only had someone like us, this video, this podcast, this conversation, to tell me at months 6 through 12, months 6 through 18, that the physical piece the first six months was one piece of it, but the rough ride is months 6 to 12 or 6 to 18. If I would have been more aware of it, I would have handled it better. But boy, did it hit me out of nowhere, which really leads me to the, to, to, to the third piece of it. Uh, and then we'll summarize, and, I, and I'll ask you for, for any questions or comments. Sure. My family. Um, yeah, big part of it is our family. Some survive yeah. it, some don't. So let's see where you're at. I mean, I've, yeah. I've watched your YouTube channel, so it's, it's a happy ending. Yeah, it is. It is. But it, it comes with, um, you know, I, I get emotional. I still cry. <laughs> when I talk about my, my children, because people don't understand and forget about adolescents. I, I, adults don't understand. Unless you're one of us on this podcast today or know someone and you're here in a loving way to support them. I heard someone say the other day, Geraldine, if, if, if you come back from this, you're, you're lucky. Um, but, if, and if you, but if you love someone and come back from this, you're incredibly lucky <laughs> um, because it, it, it affects so much. And I try to explain it, but I'll tell you, if, if I could have played for my children some of your podcast and some of my videos back then, I think it would have helped a lot. Um, my, my, I have three children, um, a boy, a girl, and a boy. Uh, my son's 27, my daughter's 25, and my little guy's 17. And my oldest son, uh, I'll talk about him in a minute, but the person that this really affected was my daughter. Um, my daughter, Allie, uh, all, all she was used to and, and wanted what was, was her dad. Her, her dad to be her advocate, her dad to be her support person, um, her dad to, to be there, um, to help her. Uh, she had some rough years in college. Uh, she had some, 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 so some tough incidents, uh, and, and, and I wasn't there. And, and 
until we got into therapy, and by the way, I still attend therapy with my children every Wednesday at one o'clock. Mm -hmm. um, and I find it to be so healthy. But until I heard them tell the story, Geraldine, of what they, what they had experienced, I mean, they, they thought that their, their dad didn't love them. And, you know, I, I, I spent those first six months, as you know, from our conversations, living in a closet. I had no idea what agoraphobia was, but as you know, on, and once you get through the physical stuff and get into the second stage, as we talked about, um, you, you, you don't want to see or talk to anybody. Uh, you don't want bright lights. You don't want to go to work. You don't want to leave your apartment. You don't want to leave the closet. And God forbid somebody knocks or rings your doorbell, you will be flung into a major meltdown and panic attack. God forbid you look at your mail because you think that people are coming after you through the mail and bills and everything. And God forbid your phone rings. You got to keep your ringer off for months because you are thinking the worst. When someone calls, they're telling you somebody died or a catastrophe happened. Uh, looking back now, I, I realize that was not me. But I'll tell you, when you're going through it, so for, for three years, you know, my daughter saw a father who used to go out to dinner with her and used to visit her at school, um, basically not spend any time with her and avoid her and not pick up her calls and not go to dinner with her. And when she had trouble, wasn't there to talk to. And, um, and it hurt her so bad. And I, I just, I see the pain. And uh, thank God, thank God I found recovery from that. And, and, and we do get better. But Geraldine, that, that was my daughter. What really shook me was my oldest son. My oldest son is a hero to me. Um, he, he's a, as I've mentioned before, he's a, you know, a pro basketball player in Europe, um, great student, great athlete. And him and I were frick and frack. Him and I were ham and eggs, you know, Batman and Robin. Uh, uh, I'll tell you, we, we did it all together. Uh, my daughter um, was in such pain, but, but I never had, maybe because he was my first, I never had the connection like I had with my first son. And I watched him. We had gone to basketball together. I never missed a game during high school and college. Went over to uh, Europe to see him play pro. Never missed a game on video. I did everything with him. And for him to begin to withdraw from me, what later came out in therapy was, he saw his sister in so much pain and how bad she was hurting from her lack of relationship with her father mm -hmm. that, that he didn't understand benzo withdrawal or benzodiazepines either. So he said, you know, God damn, dad, if you're not going to love your own daughter, then I can't have a relationship with you. Oh. And so my little guy, Ethan, at 17, he saw the two of them, especially my son withdraw, and he had enough with me. And yet I was still strapped to a couch. And I, I, I had no idea how it impacted them. And, and God, I, I wish they were a little bit older than little children that aren't going to remember your kids are going to remember. Yeah, it. yeah they, you know, to, they, 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 they thought their dad didn't love them. Right. And, and I, I've explained to them that, you know, it, it was this disease. It was this poison we were put on. And it was this withdrawal that they have seen a lot in their community um, with withdrawal, but it's been primarily heroin and opiates, you know, people they grew up with. So they see the physical pain 
And then, you know, it's not uncommon. Uh, and I don't speak, I, you know, I'm just trying to speak for myself and, and from what they've told me. Uh, certainly not any medical advice, but, you know, they, they've seen people come back from some other addictions where they were out playing basketball a couple months later because the, the, the real struggle was that part one, the physical part. Um, they had, uh, uh, you know, they, they, they could not understand why can't dad leave his apartment? He's been clean for two years. And, um, you know, you know, Jennifer out in California, yep. um, she battled for seven. And uh, I, I, you know, I'm, everybody's different. You, you don't put a time limit on it uh, and certainly don't want to discourage anybody. Um, but I think being honest is also important. And that right. is this one, benzos, because of the brain damage, brain damage. We have brain damage. Because of that, it's going to take longer. But the beauty of my story is, is that we do get better and we do heal. Right. And, and everybody so, heals differently. You know, everybody yes. is genetically different. Some are so ill and they have nobody helping them that they're they're not even eating well. So they're not even feeding their body. So that's, I right. think, where a lot of the difference comes in. Because I was agoraphobic for five years. Yeah. I've always been open and honest that it took a long time to heal. Yeah. Until I healed what the benzos did to my body, you know, leaky gut, the liver, I had to take care of that. Yeah, for sure, for sure. And, and you know, what, what I, I live in Philadelphia, as you know, and um, I, I go down to the beach, go down to what we call the shore um, in New Jersey for the summer. And I'll never forget uh, the summer two and a half years in, where I decided to go for a run on the boardwalk in Ocean City. Oh, love it down there. I've been there. Yes. Beautiful. I love the smell and I love of the air and the, and the water. And I, I ran the boardwalk that morning. I'll tell you, it was July 18th. I know the specific date mm -hmm. <laughs> and time. I got out at 7 o'clock. And I ran both ends, two and a half miles, five miles, and about a mile into this thing, Geraldine, I had my window open up. And I saw, I saw the water. And I saw how blue it is. And I saw the sand and how white it was. And I saw the sky and how blue it was and the sun and the buildings and the smell. Uh, I had forgotten that with this benzo addiction that I had forgotten to see colors and smell. And as I was running that day and looking at people and seeing their, their shorts, their types of sneakers, the stores, which one was selling cotton candy, which one was selling caramel corn, who was selling breakfast sandwiches, where I was, the smell of coffee running through the Ocean City Coffee Company. Um, I knew, I knew that I was, I was back. Um, for the first time since being a young teenager, pre 16 year old panic attack on the train, 30 years of psych meds, primarily benzodiazepines, it was all gone. It was all gone. And I got home and went to the house and probably cried for a good two hours with my kids and told them that I loved them and that dad was, dad was here. Yeah. And um, it, I, we haven't looked back uh, like I said, we go to therapy weekly. Uh, my, my son has me at Orange Theory, which is crazy, where you yeah. row the boat and run and everything. Yeah. Um, my daughter, uh, we were down in Florida the, uh, this weekend, just us, ju just dad and Allie. Um, she's getting married. We spent a lot of time talking about her wedding and my role in it. 
and my advice to her, which she asked for, and my 17-year-old son, Ethan, I, I thought it was way too late, especially when my mind was lying to me, because that's what it does. It's not you, and you are being lied to. You know, Eckhart Tolle talks so brilliantly about as you're getting off of this stuff, there's, you know, the, you, you have to realize there's there's two people. There, there, there's the one that's feeling all that pain, and then there's the one that actually sees that person, sees what's happening to them, and that's the person you're trying to get to. And I found it. My, my relationship today with my children, significant other, uh, friends, is, is deeper than it's ever been. And I'll tell you what, um, you know, the work you do and the person you are, I love you. And I've got no problem with people that I care about telling them things like that. Um, I was numb for 30 plus years. Not only didn't I smell or didn't I see colors, I didn't feel anything unless it was interdose withdrawal coming on. And now I feel, and God, that's a scary thing, isn't it? Sometimes, yeah, um, because you feel everything. I'm, you I'm know? a crier you, in the family. I'm yeah, you know, if anything you happy, know, I cry. Sad, I cry. You I'm, feel it. You literally feel kids, everything. Yeah, my my kids, my kids, kid with me about you know watching a movie and then I'm blubbering away, or even a good commercial, and I love it. And even the bad stuff, you yeah. know, a funeral, a, a, a sick family member. I feel that losing my mother last February, being clean, sober, and recovered completely, and standing by her bedside and sleeping on the floor uh, at the hospital for the six days until she passed, mm -hmm. um, I would not trade that for anything in this world. And look, I'm going to be 55 next month. Uh, I did not begin my recovery off this stuff till I was 50 years old. Um, it, it's, it's not, it's not too late. It, it's never too late. No, for never us. too late. Yep. It, and it, and I think not. people think like you, because you were on for 30 years that they yeah. can never heal and you can, yeah. it doesn't matter how long it's how, first of all, like I said, genetically, but how well you take care of yourself. So Bill, if you don't mind, I want to just well, go let me, back. Let me just say, yeah, let me say sure. one thing just to finish before yeah. I forget. I, I'll tell yeah. you that. I talked about family and whatnot. Yeah. The biggest love story here is the love story of me, of myself. Um, you know, you become very shame-based, very guilty. Uh, you get all of your self-identification by people-pleasing, never standing up for yourself, and getting your self-worth from what other people think of you. And that's exhausting. You know, you talk about anxiety and depression uh, when you're so ashamed of yourself that all of your self-worth comes from what other people think of you. Geraldine, you're happy with me today? OK, I'm OK. Oh, you're upset with me? Oh, what is it? What is it? I'm awful. Um, that's a that's a tough road. And and, and the, the thing about this recovery process is you learn to love your, yourself. Um, I'm divorced. Um, I I. I fell in love for the first time in my life recently. And this is not an indictment of anybody else that was in my life, but I love for the first time in certain scenarios with people. And it's because I was incapable of that. When you hate yourself as much as I hated myself, especially during this addiction, you can't, you, you, you can't love anyone. I mean, you know, I, I did with what good addicts do, right? I, I, I took a hostage, um, got, ma you know, got married, took a hostage, then added additional small hostages to the, to, to, to the deal. And, you know, there's a lot of uh, uh, amends that needs to be made, um, you know, especially to my ex-wife and especially to family members. She's one of my very best friends now. 
and she'll give me a great, honest critique of this podcast today because she loves me and I love her. Right. And uh, and it's just it's just a miracle. And 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 when you said at the very beginning, Phil's story is interesting because not only has he recovered, he's better than he was before. I am 110 percent of what I was before 16 and getting on this stuff. Because when you come out the other side of this living hell, you are fearless. You know, if you lose a job, if you get into a car accident, if you're late on a bill, if you lose your house, if you're not paying your bills on time because you're struggling, you know what you do? You, 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 you nod and say, oh, well, I'll, I'll get it. I'll do the best I can. But, but the reason I say I'm better than I am today is, you know, all the things I talked about, family, love, never too late. But the last thing is, is you literally are fearless. There is no hell or no pain or no punishment, and I speak for myself, on this earth that was worse than when I went through than benzodiazepine withdrawal. And so now on the other side of it, I think it's important, like, like we talk about, those of us who have walked through hell and were fortunate enough to come out the other side to bring back water buckets for the rest of us. Exactly. And I do that fearlessly. I live my life with gusto. I don't worry about wasted time anymore because that was one of the, the, the mental things during stage two. Um, I, I, am, I am as happy a person today than I've been in my entire life. And that is a miracle. So, you know, summarizing this, and I'll turn it back to you. Stage one, there's a gazillion horror stories out there about what happened to folks. I chose today not to spend a lot of time rehashing with so many of us have heard uh, and shared. Um, but I did want to take time that when I had enough and the year was coming to an end and I made the decision to start the new year off and defeat this, I gave you my physical remedies that didn't work and the ones that did for me. And hopefully that'll give some guidance and some help. Number two, I wanted to talk about that second stage, pause, post-acute withdrawal sy uh, syndrome, and how vicious it was, and how looking back now, if I could have listened to this podcast and someone would have told me, my older Phil would have told my younger Phil, this is what's coming, I know I would have done so much better. And so I'm blessed for you for doing these types of things. And then number three, my family, my broken, brutalized relationship with my children and it not being too late and healing and coming full circle, the blessing in this addiction was that it turned into a love story. And other than the other people I love in my life, I finally found out who I was and I became someone who could love themselves and actually now I can shower in front of the mirror. I used to shower and brush my teeth in the shower so I didn't have to look at myself during the midst of this addiction. I look at myself now, I make a joke with it, I have fun and I like who I'm seeing back. And uh, I am just so, so grateful uh, and grateful for this opportunity to share with you and your audience um, today. Yeah, I actually did a podcast on um, surviving the holidays for 2020, and I put in there things that I'm grateful for, and a lot of it was the experience I went through. Yeah, because it, it really does make us um, we're much more empathetic, we care more, we love more. I agree with everything. Um, yeah, I think. So I actually, look, I think a lot of my anxiety and depression came from, um, you know, I'm 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 a child. Uh, I, God bless my parents. I love them dearly. Um, you know, I'm a child of, of a, a severe alcoholic dysfunctional family. And, you know, the holidays for me 
um, were a nightmare growing up. And, and I don't mean that to, to upset my, my, my mom's gone, sorry, mom, uh, up in heaven, uh, or to my father. Um, he's been sober 22 years now, by the way, and is one of my best buddies. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, I, I, I continued the tradition uh, with anxiety and then addiction to benzos of destroying Christmases and ruining Christmases. And if I was going to have a miserable Christmas, everybody else was, too. Um, these last couple of Christmases are where Christmas should be. Um, and and my, my children are finally enjoying the type of Christmas that, um, uh, uh, that, they, that they deserve. And I deserve. Right. It's never too late for because we yeah. know a lot of families have been destroyed because of the prescriptions that they were given. They were good patients. And we know a lot of people have lost their relationship with their children or, you know, parents, sisters, brothers. That's what bothers me why I still do this. Um, yeah. So just a, I wanted just a few questions to go back over a few things. When we spoke, yeah. one of the things you talked about was Trudy Scott's book, The Anti-Anxiety Food Solution. Yes. That you use that to help Great you read. basically eat foods out of that. I try to. I, 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 I definitely try to. It's, uh, um, it, it's been really, really helpful. Uh, and, and you know what? Getting on our email list, and I'm sure you probably are, no, for um, years, just, yeah. Just the, yeah, just the tips and the forums that she sends out probably every other day. Right. And uh, yeah, um, the other thing for me is reminders. Right. I mean, I forget until I get into the habit, like trying to stay in the present moment. I would put little cards around my house that would say present. So when I started to think negative and get the intrusive thoughts, I would walk into a kitchen and on the fridge, it would say presence. And so I'd snap out of it. I'd uh, go to the bathroom and look in the sink over the mirror. It would say present. And so I would snap out of it. Um, so I'm someone that needs the daily affirmation, that needs right. to read the daily affirmation, that needs to have someone like Trudy Scott send me reminders uh, uh, all the time. And, and as you know, Jennifer Lee, um, her, her uh, blog and, and her articles on her seven year healing journey are so powerful. Um, and that's another one I would, I would definitely subscribe to. I, I don't know uh, if she calls it something or whether, I mean, if you just look, look her up, you can sign up oh, for yeah. her emails yep. on her yep. Benzo site. Um, she is uh, one of my faves too. Okay. And then you took the Epsom salt uh, bots with lavender. But when we spoke, you also said, did you take magnesium for sleep? Because I did back then. And I actually still do. I, I love it uh, for me. Now, again, we're uh, all different. So I yeah. don't push supplements. I do. But the magnesium really kicked in for me. Um, in addition to the Epsom, you know, the Epsom salt obviously is where you get a lot of magnesium through the skin. Um, right. The issues are in our tissues, get it to the tissue. Um, but, uh, uh, yes, I, I, I take, I, I actually now take a small, uh, uh, amount of magnesium, um, in the morning and I find that it relaxes me for the day. Yeah. I do two uh, in the morning great. and two at night. Yeah. I do magnesium yes. glycinate, but I do professional brands. I wouldn't just buy anything in the store. I'm very careful what I take. Um, now I actually knew years ago about the Epsom salt bots because one of the girls, you know, as we're coming up doing it, she's doing the bots, but when yeah. I did it, I did the hot bath with the Epsom salt. I couldn't wait to get in. I don't even think I lasted five minutes and my heart's racing and I had to jump yeah. out. But for me, it yeah. was too soon at that point. I was deathly sick. Um, yeah. Now, one of the other things you did. Yeah. Hey, listen, can I tell you when I, yeah. when I, the first six months, you, you know, the restless leg is one of the most oh, insane things. I wanted things. to cut my legs off. <laughs> oh. But, you know, it, I would say the Epsom salt bath, the first like 60 days, got me uh, like 20 minutes of relief. So when I said I was taking 10, 15 a night, um, I, I, I actually made sure I had a huge hot water uh, heater um, so I didn't run out. But what I would do is I'd put my computer on and I would listen to, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, people like Ryan Donnelly, uh, who's got a ton of stuff on YouTube. God, God rest in peace for him. He passed. Um, but, um, great stuff, your podcast, um, that would be like, uh, I would look forward to it so much 
because I pictured my brain with a little man in there with a, with like a like a big uh, a welder mask on, rewiring my brain with his little fire torch and his stuff. And I would get in there and I would listen to your stuff and and everybody in our community stuff. And uh, I'll tell you, I, w w when you are at the end of your rope and you know what it's like to be at your end of your rope, a scalding hot Epsom bath and then to distract like the Netflix, listening to some of the wonderful personalities and speakers we've met in our community here. Um, oh, it is, uh, I, dare I say, lifesaver, but it's a yeah. lifesaver. It is fantastic. Oh, yeah. Hope and distraction are, are so important because if not, then the looping starts, you know. Um, <laughs> oh, yes. So in, in listening to your YouTube, uh, one of your talks, you mentioned um, your gut. And I noticed when we talked, you talked about bone broth. So you did protein smoothies and bone broth. So did that help you? Because I know some can't do it. I can do bone broth. You know, that's very healing to the gut. I did. I did. And, and, and I'll tell you what, what got me on to the bone broth. And thank you so much. You know, I forget. We forget so much. I know. Um, uh, I, you, you, you are giving me some great uh, uh, lead-ins here. Um, you know, the, the, it, I tried the bone broth not so much because of the healing benefits. All I had heard was that it was okay and it, it's, it's good for people uh, uh, in withdrawal. Um, but but I, I was so nauseous. I, I, I lost, you know, I'm, I'm 220 on average. Uh, I was down about 164 in the middle of the withdrawal and looked every bit of it. Uh, my bones were coming through my face and, uh, and, and I couldn't really get a lot of food down early on. And the bone broth is something that was soothing and I was able to keep it down. And as I did Very more nourishing. research, yeah. yeah. And as I did more research on it, you know, you read about, uh, you know, there's, there's 90 or 95, uh, uh, minerals in, 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 in the world and, you know, we, we have some of all of them in our in our systems and, and bone broth supplies, you know, and I, I'm just speaking hearsay now. Uh, I, I don't have the facts, but but I, I don't think there's a, 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 a substance out there that contains more of each of the individual minerals out of the hundred or whatever there are uh, than bone broth. So as a replenisher, wonderful, yeah. wonderful. And you thank know, you. And for, I, thank I, you yeah, for the reminder. I my own. Right. I made my own and I want people to understand something. Bone broth, which has the minerals in it, and we need minerals to detoxify, which is God's way of helping us to detoxify. You don't just drink a bowl of it. It is medicine. So you start with just a quarter of a yes. cup. You don't, you never overdo with it. And that's something I, I, I yes. one woman who got very sick, she goes, well, I have a big bowl in the morning. I have a big bowl in the afternoon. I'm like, no, no, no. And she was like, and then again at dinner, you can get very sick. Everything we do should be done gently and slowly. And you can, now they have bone broth you can buy. And I think when Jennifer Lee and I spoke one time, I told her about Sally Fallon's uh, book, her cookbook, Nourishing Traditions. And in there, it tells you how to make a beautiful- Hey, can you, can you say that again? So it's Sally Fallon's book is called Nourishing Traditions. And it's nourishing really the, Traditions. Yeah, nourishing Traditions. Thank it's you. a wonderful book. And in there, it tells you how to make uh, really all different types of these bone broths. And I've been doing it for years. In fact, you know, there isn't a chicken or a turkey I'm going to cook, or if there's beef bones, I'm making a good uh, broth out of them and I save them. So um, now again, in listening to your, into your YouTube, um, and I think when we would, no, I don't know if we would talk about, I was listening to all your YouTubes. You did a little acupuncture, which I yes. think is great. I wish, I wish it wasn't so expensive and all yes. insurance should cover it. Yes. Cause Cindy Samora, who I interviewed, um, one of my first Benzo friends, acupuncture truly helped open everything up for her body to heal. Yeah. Yeah. So what I'll tell you about my experience is that, um, when my anxiety got bad to the point, you know, I eventually had to go back to work. Right. Mm -hmm. And, uh, when, when you're, when your anxiety and your, your negative intrusive thoughts and your looping's going on, you're not getting anything done. You are so ineffective and so helpless. And so the, the, the uh, acupuncture for me, um, I, I, I tell people it, it took the top off of the anxiety. It, it, it wasn't as powerful 
as it is for some folks, like like the woman you just referenced. Oh, but yeah. it, it took it took enough away that I was able to be a decent employee um, and function. Uh, and the other thing I learned about the acupuncture um, in my experience is it, going once a month wasn't cutting it. Uh, I ended up having to go, and you're right, it gets cost prohibitive for some folks. I ended up having to go as a routine and habit. And when I would string together multiple acupunctures in a relatively short period of time, that's when I got maximum benefit. Um, I guess my body just got adept to it and was able to read it better. Um, but, uh, I, you know, the more I did it, the more helpful it was. Um, I, I, I tried it on and off once or twice and felt like I had not much uh, benefit. But then when I got some consistency uh, to it, I noticed a nice benefit. Right, right. Yeah, I, I know here in Boston, it's so expensive. I could not do it a lot. It was here and there. And I... You know, it should be covered under health insurance, you know, but hey, it, for some it is. You know, I have some friends with their work health insurance. They get like so many visits, which is great. Yes. Um, I'm trying to think of some. So I, I, I want to say this because I have a, a thing called getting ready to taper. I think it was the second podcast that we did. And I like that you prepared, you know, even though yes. you were sick and you prepared and people don't prepare for this. It's as I've always said, you don't just get up and run a marathon, prepare. So if I was starting over again today, I would be taking a minimum of three months, six months, and maybe even longer to get my body healthy. We are not healthy. These drugs affect our guts. Yeah. We don't, genetically, we're not all the same. So the fact that you did all that preparation, even pre to prepare to sweat, I thought was wonderful. I yeah. mean, you know, your YouTube uh, people really need to go to that and we will put a link to it. You give some great advice and you, you know what? We have a lot of women on the group, but, and the men, I think it's great when they come out and say how sick they were and this is what they did to get better. Yeah. The, we um, need the medical it, profession listening to us. <laughs> oh, boy, you're not kidding. You, you are not kidding. Um, I, I, you know, you, you, you talk about the women. Both my calls later today are with women. Um, and their profile is they're, they're very successful, professional, and, and they're one heck of uh, uh, a couple of moms. And I'll tell you, they're, 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 they're in pain, uh, interdose withdrawal and not getting any relief. Um, but they're big. Uh, I thought of them. That's why I said at the very beginning, we're, we're toward the end of the year here. Um, there tends to be some downtime after Christmas. And we do like to gear up toward the new year because we get a little bit of break. Um, the, the, when I talk to these women, the, the, their story is, I, I can't, I can't get better. Um, I, I, I have a job. Uh, I have both of them happen to be single, single parents. I, I have a house to run. I have children to raise and I'm, I'm just going to sacrifice myself until the kids are old enough. Uh, I just don't have the time. I, I cannot be in bed, uh, for long stretches of time, uh, or I have a big problem. And, and, you know, that, that's why I, I say right now, um, we're, we're at a period, uh, at the end of the year where things slow down a bit, uh, and boy, oh boy, um, if you're looking for a silver lining uh, to COVID, um, the, you know, the silver lining to COVID is uh, being able to work at home. Uh, I, 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 I don't mean this facetiously, um, but my goodness, what a blessing COVID would have been uh, and, and, and homework and, and home yeah. everything uh, when I went through uh, uh, this process um, because, uh, you know, uh, they, they tell us there's a blessing in everything. Uh, well, maybe why we're uh, locked down and under quarantine. Uh, maybe that's maybe that's uh, God's message to us uh, to uh, do it now uh, and, and make a blessing and a positive out of a very negative right. situation. And even if they're sick right now, I mean, I was sick on the drugs the whole time. You know, I had given birth. I said, I don't feel well. I'm given Ativan and here comes 10 years of being drugged. But at one point, a friend sends me to a nutritionist. I am in interdose withdrawal. I am, I am just so sick all the time. And yes. there's nowhere for you to go but up. But I went to this nutritionist and he changed my diet. I still don't understand the drugs are making me sick. And I'm able to get stronger with the diet. And I'm actually coming off Ativan. I don't even know what I did to taper. Yeah. But I got down to a half a milligram. So, you know, take the time. 
Nobody's pushing you off fast. Take your time, slow it down, build yourself up. Go see a nutritionist, see a functional medicine doctor, a naturopath. If it's hurting you that bad, there's so many different ways to come off. There's so many different ways to heal. It's yeah. not one way. We're not a one size fits all. No, the, the, the one point you're making, though, that I think is missed a lot is, um, you know, it, it's not a race. I forget the actual wording you use, but, you know, the, look, it, it, taper, 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 taper. And that's, that's, if there's one thing that I would say to the medical community, um, you know, it, 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 if we could taper this over, you know, a, you know, a year or years or yeah. uh, using the Ashton manual, I think yeah. every no race, yeah. no, it, it's not. And, and, uh, and, and so many of the mistakes, I don't know if you'd agree with me, but so many of the mistakes that I see in people that reach out to me, um, you know, I say, you know, well, what, what, what have you, you know, what, what have you done? And they said, well, I was told by my doctor to, you know, cut my dose in half in every two weeks. Yeah. Uh, and I should be fine in six weeks. And there is no such thing as benzo withdrawal. So, you know, in yeah. six weeks, it must be something else wrong with me. I mean, um, uh, just just traumatic and horrific advice. Um, there, from yeah, the there community. is no race, and you know, take uh, you know a micro taper, uh, a liquid taper. Uh, the way it's laid out in the Ashton manual, um, you know, my goodness, if if that was required reading um, for every physician and or psychiatrist, uh, uh, that would be a blessing. Yeah. And I want to say one of the things that you said today that I absolutely loved was time, things I must earn. You know, take your time and earn your health back. It's yeah. not this quick thing. And unfortunately for some, and it breaks my heart, their doctors, no matter what, are going to force them off. And yeah. even in that case, you can still heal. We've seen many, yes. that, you know, did go to rehabs, their doctors forced them off cold turkey, or they tapered them too fast. And sometimes they got better than somebody who micro tapered, because again, Somebody can sit at home and micro taper and they're sitting eating like, you know, just peanut butter sandwiches, you know, a Coke and they're not, they're not feeding their body. So everyone is different. No, I, I agree. I, I totally agree. And, and I, I, I feel like I went a little too quickly as well. Um, but, you know, part of my addictive personality uh, as an addict is, um, you know, I, I probably jumped a little too soon. Um, but at the same time, for someone like me, um, uh, tapering, you know, is, is, uh, uh, it, it, it's hard. Um, right. um, but, uh, um, you know, I, I, uh, I, I think to stick with it and, and to levelize, um, so that you don't, um, have to deal with, uh, right. um, what's the phrase I'm thinking when we, when we re up, uh, we re up our dose. Kindling. Yeah. yeah. So you don't have to yeah. deal with kindling. And again, um, I said, come down, and, really come down do and sit for a while, right? Yeah. Come down and right. sit for a while. Right. And if people listen to your YouTube channel, they'll find out, you know, that you're alcoholic, you're many, many years clean now, which yes. is, and so probably that you want to just jump and let's be done with it. You know, which, Hey, a lot of people have said, I can't do this. I'm just going to jump. Um, and, and, you know, they should never advise somebody else to do it. We have to do our own journey on this to what we're comfortable, who has support, who doesn't. Yeah. Um, but Phil, I really, I want to thank you so much because I have so many people waiting to hear your interview. Yeah. So, uh, well, we listen, you know, yeah. the, the, the other thing that, that, that I would say, um, that I wish I could have done differently mm -hmm. is I, I, I wish I would have been more honest with people. Um, when, when, when I finally came to my, uh, work people and, and told them the truth and why I was performing so poorly and, uh, why I was a mess and why I was shaking it, you know, they, and I think we find this all the time. Um, the, the, the waiting up to the procrastinating, we begin to paint a more miserable story in our heads of what's going to happen. And it just never seems to be as bad as we think once we get it over. And I got to tell you, I was embraced with so much love and hugs and, and, and people proud of me. Um, and, 
you know, and, and, and eventually now they come in and talk to me about their problems. Um, but I, 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 I wish I would have had the courage um, to be honest, not with everybody, but with the people that were going to be directly impacted, especially my kids being older kids with what was going on. Um, uh, I, I, I was a coward and, and I, I tried to hide things from people that love me. And, um, you know, if, if I had it to do over again too, um, I, I, I would have been honest with the people that care about me, um, yeah. because they I just, agree. they embraced me. Um, they certainly did not, did not penalize me for my, for my, Right. Honesty. Yeah. When I learned after 10 years that it was the, you know, the Ativan I was taking that was making me sick all those years, I did. I found one little book back then. That's all that was around 23 years ago. Yeah. I read it. I did talk to my my kids were young. They were 10 and 14 at the time. Very young. Yeah. And, you know, my my family, my my husband's family, my friends, you know, I said, hey, I found out why I'm sick. So yeah. I was lucky. And I, I did a podcast with one of my childhood friends where she told nobody and suffered in silence and lost all her friends. Yeah. And I took the different approach and told. So you're right. I think telling people again, we we could be open. You know, you yeah. could, you you know, you wish you were more open back then. But, yeah, yeah. I agree. If we tell people that they're, they're they're more able i think to help us if they understand it yeah and the uh the the uh the key to benzo withdrawal or my key for benzo withdrawal um you know i i i have a lot of people that have just sent that to family members um yeah. that just say i i can't explain it um you think i'm lazy you think i don't want to keep a job you think i want to lay in bed all day um, I've talked to I'm blue in the face. Listen to this. You know, th this is someone that we don't know from Adam and he's putting into words how I'm feeling. Um, and, and, and I recommend that too, because, you know, the families, because of the extended time with some of the Benzo stuff, they just, they just don't understand it. And there's so much bad information out there. They're misinformed. Exactly. And that's why that's why we all do what we do. We keep helping others. We don't want them to lose their families. We want them to know they're going to get better. Yes. So you are doing great work. And uh, I really appreciate you being on the show today, Phil. Thank you. I love you to death. Thanks for everything you, you do. Bye. And I am always here. Uh, and it's a real uh, privilege. Uh, and to your your expert producer and audiovisual <laughs> expert, Garrett. Um, my, my son, Garrett's Garrett, here. Thank Thank you so much. Um, all of us chipping in together, I think, makes a difference. It will. Thank you so much, Phil. Take care. All righty. Bye-bye. All right, Garrett, we just finished the interview with Phil, which I had been waiting to do him. We knew we wanted him for our 30th show where he was on uh, benzos and other meds for 30 years. What did you think? Uh, so I think I, I wasn't expecting him to be as passionate about helping people as he was. You had told me a little bit about him, but, you know, I think you can tell from the interview, you know, just a lot of energy behind trying to help others and tell his story and trying to encourage people that they can do the same thing as him there's always a way back right i mean it's kind of when you've been injured the way we've been injured you just don't want anybody else to go through it and i thought the part where um you know he's still very emotional about his family because it affects our kids so much i mean you kids were definitely affected you know in in different ways we we were able to i think because you were younger maintain um you know the relationship and i did the best i could and, you know, he he didn't want to get into everything of how he tape, how he came off um, or all the suffering because it's so bad. But like he said, nobody fully prepares you for the mental that thought about dying. I either thought I was going to die constantly, beg God to take me, didn't want to do it anymore. But you do get to the other side. And even if I think somebody had fully prepared me, you just it throws you off guard. Right. You just you don't know until you go through it. Yeah. But what is it that 
you say you know wanted to die i thought you were going to die what was going on in your head or in your body that made you feel that way i mean and I why think, didn't you tell anybody but you you all knew i couldn't leave the, i couldn't be left alone in the house remember that i could i always thought i was i didn't want to die alone so when you were so agoraphobic like i was i don't think i ever realized that's the thought that was going through your head i think i always knew you didn't want to be alone but i didn't you know i don't even know if i would have been able to kind of understand that no, you at, were too at the young. age i was to, right. but what was it that I I my nervous system was it's as if somebody just took my nervous system away so to have somebody here they were like my natural tranquilizer I you know I could not be left alone I remember one time I tried and I had my mother and my brother had gone out you kids were somewhere with dad probably and um I had to call my mother and say, come back. And they were going to go to something. She was here from Florida, and they were going to something. I said, please come back. I, I can't be here alone. And another time, Dad's cousin had to come. Our Aunt Betty would come. I could not be left alone. My body was sick. My nerves were gone. It's a horrible thing. And, you know, in fact, he, he he's telling, trying to say how bad it is. It's And you're thinking about death a lot because you're Do never you so sick. You could have differentiated between things happening in your head because of your nervous system and then an actual physical symptom like if you were having heart palpitations would you be able to differentiate that so uh, there were a lot of times i would wake up and i would had a lot of tachycardia attacks you know you wake up your heart's racing so it's like oh uh, i would you're say yeah I'm, I'm having a heart well first of all all the stress you're under because my father died at 47 from his heart i thought it's going to kill me anyway what i'm going through is going to kill me now, again, I want to remind people, I did not come off in any nice way. There was no information for me, you know, 23 years ago. I came off three milligrams of Ativan in four months. Talk about, as Dr. Pert said, even that's still considered cold turkey. So I came off in a very brutal way, um, and it was hard, and it was fast. So um, the other thing I liked that he did is because, you know, when we did our uh, Getting Ready to Taper podcast, he prepared he knew he was going to be sick at home, and he took the time. He had the water and the lemons, and, you know, he had the extra clothes because he knew he was going to be sweating. I mean, that's a lot. A lot of people don't prepare, but he prepared because, you know, of how he came off. But um, let me just tell you, it's even though we're telling people how bad it was, we want the medical community. We want people to listen, family members. What we go through is real. And and we want this someday for people to be able to come off slowly, gently. And again, you know, I'm a big believer in preparing the body first. My body was sick after being on Ativan for 10 years. It was very sick. And then I put it through a, a rough withdrawal. Yeah, and I think that's probably, in my mind, what would be the hardest part for me is that you are going through these terrible withdrawals. But I, I think for the most part, people don't believe you or can't understand it. No. Where if you were telling them you were trying to detox from or come off of heroin or something like that, they would understand right away how terrible it is and, you know, understand the suffering. But that's the thing. They actually understand heroin or opioids, but it's over in a couple of weeks. Right. And this Benzos. Is not... it, it is not over in a couple of weeks. Now, for some lucky ones, sure it is. But for some of us that genetically were not made that way, no, it's not an easy ride. And, you know, like him and I were saying, people... It's in your own hands how to come off. You can slow it down. You can even stop and build yourself up at any point. There is no hurry. There's no set schedule. That's why, you know, when we go into the state house, we're big believers in the symptom, a guide, a symptom guided taper. Yeah. Uh, but you can understand where people are coming from. They want off. And, you know, it's hard to tell people, you know, it might be potentially years. And But some people have actually made that choice. They want off and they go into a detox or they will do a rapid taper we all have choices to make just know be well educated but even the medical profession is not well educated in it which i hope with all that we do that eventually that is going to happen yeah. you know but great show i am so glad we waited phil and we want to remind people and we're going to put a link to his youtube channel he is very encouraging you know he tells it like it is and as you know, when we go into the state house, it's mostly women. And a lot of times the men have been too sick to come in, and we've had very few men. And when they do come in, they're great. I, I love when yeah. they come in and talk, and Phil is a great representative to out be out there speaking. This is not something that just the women can't get through. I used to think, 
that I was a very weak person when I went through it. I would cry all the time that I was weak. I didn't have what he had where I hated myself. I, I looked at my life that I had, and I wish you kids knew me as that person because you saw me sick on the drugs for 10 years, like what was happening to me. I became anxious. I became ha had panic attacks. I became agoraphobic on them. And then coming off was even worse. Um, but I was a strong person. And when you get to the other side, you realize what a strong person you are to do that. And we're doing it without a lot of help. So I think lining up your support is important. Like he was saying, he wishes that he had kind of told people ahead of time. But he is telling them now, and they're wonderful. Yeah. All right. Great show. So glad we waited for Phil. And I hope that this really encourages anybody listening to this. You listen to him, how strong his voice is. He is passionate. He has such great feelings and emotion, and that's what comes back. You know, when he talked about the cry, you know, the crying that we get so emotional. Well, you know, even my kids make fun. They they see my foot start shaking. I cry at happy things, sad things, um, everything. You know, like I become the one that they're like, "Are you crying?" Like I'll even be telling a story, right, Garrett? Or tell yeah. a story, and I start crying. I, I literally feel even a couple of emotional commercials. Oh, commercials! I. I don't, you know, I and not that I ever was an emotional person before, but now I don't know what it is that I'm so emotional. And that it, it's almost to the point that I want to start lying with, like, are you crying? I'm like, no. <laughs> <laughs> and everybody knows that I'm, here she goes, or we're watching something, and they start looking because, like, oh, she's going to cry. They don't even let me enjoy it. So I think, I think we should quickly, before we end, yeah. we should talk that we, we finally got to 30 episodes. Did you ever think we would get this many in, especially with how difficult it was in the beginning? In the beginning, because life just turned upside down for us, you know? And I think, uh, though, even... Even with how crazy things got with, you know, dad's health, there was, uh, it wasn't easy for us to, like, link our schedules and then plan an episode and get through an episode. Mm. And, and uh, now we've got lists of people, you yeah, know. we've produced almost 30 hours of content. Yeah, on yeah. Um, and there was something else I just thought of. Um, now, let me just give me one second because this is what happens. You know, you just lose a thought here. Um, but uh, It is a special mark, the, the 30 episode mark. And... We should probably, since this will probably be our last episode before Christmas, to kind of wish everybody, a, you know, happy holidays. Even though we did the holiday episode, but right, we do. We, we have another episode lined up, and it's edited and everything. But I don't know if it'll be out before. We might, might before save Christmas. that for the. We might save that for the new year because um, her story is. Even though she's long healed, I felt it was important to bring her story. But uh, we do want everybody to enjoy the holiday as best you can. I had many. I didn't care about it. You know, when they talk about fake it till you make it, when you have kids, I had to do things for them. I could have cared less. They were sick of hearing me say, Mom, what do you want for Christmas? I'd say, I just want my brain back. Nothing material meant anything to me. I, and again, I've, I've always been honest. I was a slow healer. It took five years before it started to turn around because I had to heal my gut from the damage and get my liver working. So the best gift I can give you for Christmas is the gift of hope. Hope and distraction are two of the most important things that we can have as we go through this. All right. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Please subscribe. Then you'll know whenever we're putting out a new uh, episode.